Hello, everybody, and welcome to another batch review, the second ever on the channel. As time moves on, I read quite a few books, but I also have a ton of videos I want to make, many of which I hope think at least will do better than your typical book review, especially for older books that not everyone is around for or really wants. So what I want to do here is get through a batch review and kind of play catch up over the last like year of the channel and give you my thoughts on some books that I finished, but just don't have the time or thoughts to justify a full review on. Without any further ado, let's just go ahead and jump on into these. Quite a few of these. In fact, I think all of them are sequels and that's kind of the problem here where it's like, okay, copy and paste a lot of my thoughts on the first first book or several books and put it on this new one. That's 80% of the review because it's the author doing as well as they did there with a whole lot of the same style themes, etc, etc. So that's kind of why they don't always justify like a full extended review process. And the most obvious example of this is going to be book nine of Malazan, Dust of Dreams. I don't have a physical copy. I read it on my Kindle. Do you, do you, want, me to, do you want me to hold up my Kindle? Is it... Is this, is this make you happy? Book of Nine, Dust of Dreams. <laughs> Erickson here did a stellar job and continues to kind of shed a lot of the rougher edges that I personally as a reader find with him. And I'm continually enjoying Malazan books on just the technical level more and more. After his recent blog post about his uh, way of writing character, I tried to take the extra step to really reframe how I interpret his characters. It's still not my favorite communication of, you know, the core concept of who his characters are, but I do have a really strong appreciation for them. And I've never denied that Erickson really is a rock solid writer for the fantasy genre. And Dust of Dreams is just displays that in so many different ways. It's got the great Malazan world, of course, yada, yada, yada. Let's not touch on those things I've hit on continually throughout Malazan reviews. I do want to specifically mention though here, Erickson did a stupendous job of exploring certain ideas and themes within this book maybe the best of any Malazan idea exploration so far. I don't know, it's been a long time since I read the early ones. I want to say, just because it's such a great fantasy book, Memories of Ice still might be up there. I don't know. Anyway, I don't think this is my favorite Malazan book of all time, but it's definitely in my top half for the series so far. And I think what we've continually seen here for the Malazan series is the payoff for so much work and effort put into building this world, finally being utilized in these final books to really just immerse the reader and tell a story that's on a level you just cannot really find easily in the genre. I'm not going to say anywhere else. There are other books that tell scale in another way, but they're usually as long, if not longer, a series with a different way of trying to build up in such a sense. After removing a certain character from the series, I can say in the least spoiler way possible in the last book, I was kind of hesitant to jump into this one because it was like, you got rid of the guy who's like the guy of all guys, the guy is guy in terms of guy. -in. And now it's like, I have to be here without him. But no, I should have had faith in Erickson. He knows how to balance out his cast. And there's plenty of people here who are interesting to follow, especially around the big ass. Uh, so this might be the bloodiest and most intense, disturbing Malazan book in terms of its focus on the grotesque nature of humanity and what we're willing to do to each other. Maybe other Malazan books have reached the same heights. I know some have gotten close, but I found myself just really strongly reacting to the way that Erickson was writing these depraved acts done on mass within Dust of Dreams. <laughs> For some reason, when I first read the title of this book, I was like, this is going to be a happier Malazan book. Dust of Dreams sounds whimsical. No, it's the dust of dreams. It's not a happy title. My bad. And here, this lives up to that name. Uh, this is like kind of the most just, here is what we're willing to do each other, the consequences of war and violence completely. I would put on the same level of like Martin's examination of the consequences of war, except on a grander scale, cause Malazan. I've seen a couple people saying online in other reviews, uh, especially on like Goodreads and stuff, that they found this to just be like over the top violence, too much, not serving a purpose and shock value. No, like, I don't know how else to say this besides obviously not like I'm just this is my opinion disagree with your opinion. You're welcome to have your opinion. My opinion of your opinions is bad because this is clearly serving a purpose to the larger themes of the book to the ideas being explored Erickson's philosophical musings. So saying it's purposeless and just for shock value is completely missing and ignoring the purpose of the story being told. So I I disagree. The reason it's so played up and so graphic 
is because he's actually trying to capture a wider idea. Disagree. And I think this might be actually one of Erickson's, if not his best usage of this style of writing, of this approach to trying to explore ideas in this way. So yeah, uh, I really like Dust of Dreams. It's still not uh, topped Memories of Ice, Memory of Ice for me. That one is still the top of the top for Malazan. And I'm really, really excited to read the final book. This book also kind of finally helped me adjust and realize like I have been reading Malazan wrong. Since the first book, I've been like sitting here thinking like, oh, this is going to build to one climax in like an MCU-esque way. We're working towards the top of the pyramid. It's all going to come together. I don't think that's what Erickson's trying to do. It's more like we got a couple mini pyramids and they're like branching together, which is a more realistic way to tell this story regardless. So I kind of have finally reframed to like, oh, we're not all building to one giant thing. It's more like these are realistic things and they're influencing each other, but it's not going to be that clean and structured, which the more I think about it, the more I like. But that's my thoughts on Dust of Dreams. One of the top of Malazan, strong, very strong. It's just not entirely my style and enjoyment, but I damn sure appreciate it. Next up, we have the one that I unfortunately have like the least amount to say, but that's because it so clearly blends into the previous book in the series. And you can kind of just take my review of that one and put it here. And that would be Parable of the Talents, the sequel to Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. I think the first book's a 10 out of 10, probably maybe the best dystopian sci-fi I've ever read. And this just felt like a completely natural progression of that story. People complained in that review that I gave away too much of the book. So I'll refrain from really saying anything here because I do believe this is a excellent story you should go in knowing less about. But really Parable of the Talents continues Octavia Butler's just kind of predicting a worst case scenario for the future, but like also a lot of things that just reflect our real world. I've hit on that a lot, so I'm not gonna really park on that note anymore. But yeah, there are things you're gonna go, <sighs> that is happening. It's just stupendous. And I think it was a very satisfying continuation of the story. I'm very sad that Octavia Butler was not able to finish. From what I read online, this was supposed to have one more entry. And unfortunately, she was unable to complete it. But there's also this weird beauty in it. Don't get me wrong, I would prefer her to finish her story. But like, it's just this masterpiece, this like unfinished symphony. And there's a certain mysticism, iconicness to that. And it just fits the legacy of this sci-fi author that's rapidly becoming one of my favorites. So I'm probably gonna be in the like top tier of books uh, I've read this year when I do like my full end of year, like review of everything I've read. It's killer, man. It's really, really, really good, but I don't want to say anything more because I think this is just gonna be a must read that I tell people to go into not knowing a whole, whole lot aside from it's just going to be eerily accurate. Now, moving on to one I read a long time ago, so I don't remember a ton of details, but I do remember being very positive on. I'm sorry I screwed this up. The Ryeria Revelations. This I finished over a year ago and I've read like 80 plus books since then. I don't know. So it's not the freshest in my head, but I peeled open my notes. What I do remember is this is a brilliant read. Uh, it definitely rides that line between many uh, fantasy things you know and have seen before, but just adding a lot of the more modern trends and ways of writing characters to improve and change up from what you're used to. And it excels at that uh, brilliantly. Character is the heart of this story. One particular friendship that does stick out and I remember vividly in my mind, uh, that is what you're going to be drawn through here. So I actually think if you really like the friendship dynamics of like gentlemen bastards, uh, that's going to be something that will immediately hook you here as well. It's kind of got that, I don't want to say buddy cop, that's such a dumb comparison and not accurate, but just like, you know what I mean? Buddies going on adventure, putting up with a lot of stuff. Uh, vibe for the kickoff and continuation of the story. I almost don't want to call it a trilogy because it's like broken up into different books. It's like the publisher made it a trilogy, but it's not really a trilogy. I don't know. However you want to read it. Uh, I don't remember it very clearly, unfortunately, but that does not reflect the quality of the material. I barely remember Witcher and I love Witcher. I just am flooding my mind with words all the time. So not a whole lot sticks anymore, like two months after I read it. And this has been more like close to a year or so. It's just, that's on my fault. I actually feel really bad because I do genuinely remember enjoying these. I like talking with the author, he's such a nice guy. I just got super busy with like, you know, life moving relationships and everything at that time in my life. So a lot of projects accidentally fell off in that time frame. This is going to pretty high on the reread for me because I actually want to experience these yet again. I will do so. And I own the physicals, but I also listened to the audiobook for these and they were definitely enjoyable. Overall, for right year revelations, 
solid seven out of 10. It's well above the average and it's got a lot of appeal there. I don't find it to be doing anything extraordinary for the genre, but I can see this being many, many people's favorites. Memory, sorrow. Thorn. I want to give a very specific compliment here. I believe I said in the review of the first book, The Dragon Bone Chair, but I want to reiterate here because it's been a long time and a lot of you didn't watch that video. This is an extremely complimentary series to specifically The Wheel of Time in many of its appeals. The way it treats fantasy, the kind of the way it acts as a bridge between classic and modern, the character work, the development of the world, the immersion in the world, three books that just deliver the highest level of quality of fantasy for its time. It's a bit older now, I believe this is going into 30-ish years since its publication, but it absolutely stands the test of time. I think the actual leg up that this trilogy has on the Wheel of Time is Tad Williams' prose. Inarguably one of the most beautiful writers fantasy has to offer. Up there with Rothfuss and Guy Gavril K, Tad Williams is going to be one of those three names that I think I frequently reference as the best writers of fantasy, and there's a reason I say that. He's just got a way with words where I don't think there was a single word in this book I would have replaced with any other. There's just tact and care taken there, and it's very, 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 very worth it. And what Tad Williams kind of naturally just gets as a benefit of being such an eloquent writer is his world becomes all that more immersive, his atmosphere all that more powerful because he does such an exquisite job of just kind of flowing the reader through the lines. It just shows the payoff of how becoming a technically great writer will enhance your overall writing. If you're someone who's constantly hearing about like, oh, the authors today don't have as strong of prose as they used to, and you're curious what an example of that would be, I don't think there's a much better place I can point you than right here. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to diss modern authors, there's just a certain appeal here that's not as prevalent in today's pages. And Tad Williams, oh, master class of his craft. I want to give a uh, deep amount of love to the character Simon, just, just, just great. Now, I will go ahead and say there are quite a few people out there who will not enjoy this as much as I did. It even falls into a problem I have with reading a lot of fantasy that's not cutting edge and kind of coming out right now, and that it falls into many of the tropes you've seen before. There's going to be beats to this story you recognize. It bothered me a little bit, and it's going to bother a lot of people who are younger picking it up who are just kind of tired of seeing that. But Tad Williams made up for it for me with just his ability to tell the sh out of that story. He also really did add some left and right turns that are going to surprise readers who are walking this path, but in general, I just didn't mind it as much as I have been recently, because as a writer, if you're just such a master of your craft, I'm not going to mind the fact because I'm enjoying just the other elements of your story while you are falling into the patterns I've seen before, and then when he's able to actually just kind of elevate what's been done before or go in a new direction, it's kind of just this whole other next level appreciation. I do wish more modern authors wrote at this level. I get it's not the best thing right now to have a more eloquent prose but this trilogy right here is just rock solid proof for me that there are just inevitable benefits to being a writer who takes the time and care to enhance and improve their just technical writing and their prose get elevated and then just kind of elevating any story you tell as a result had Williams could just write about my day and his writing of that day would be a damn good read but this has just been playing catch up with me here today. I appreciate y'all's understanding that for the health of the channel, I can't give full deep dive reviews and I don't have just a ton to say about every single one. And I hope you enjoyed this. I am going to do a full review of the last Malazan book and a series review as a whole, but these other trilogies are just kind of like, I just didn't have either a ton to say or I lost it when it was still fresh in my brain and I don't have the time to fully reread them yet. Uh, but there also is one other big change to the channel coming. I'm only going to do five videos a week now because I need to be a human being who has a life. So no more videos videos on Saturdays. It'll just be Monday through Friday for me. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace.